further ado, Dr. Dale Coulter is the professor of theology at uh, Pentecostal Theological Seminary. I have to say that he is uh, one of my favorite people and one of my favorite historical theologians. I always enjoy our conversations together. I enjoy his, his scholarship. Um, you know, one of the reasons I enjoy his scholarship is because he is a theologian for the church. And that's something I can always appreciate. So Dr. Coulter, it's a joy to have you tonight. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, um, Dan, for that introduction. And uh, it's great to be here with you and with Bishop Pelt. And thank you, Abner, for your work translating. Um, let me just tell you very briefly what I'm going to do. I want to talk for about 25 minutes or so about um, William Seymour's vision for Azusa, particularly surrounding the theology of spirit baptism that he developed. And I want to set the historical context a little bit and look at some of the challenges that he faced, um, because those challenges, I believe, led directly to his own um, going back into his deep Wesleyan roots and recovering his Wesleyanism to revision spirit baptism away from the position that Charles Parham had held and that he had first learned under Charles Parham. So that's what I want to do, just sort of talk about the context first and then look at his mature theology of spirit baptism. And we will see that it's developed uh, in relationship to racial reconciliation. And then we'll have a conversation with Bishop Pelt and Dr. Cumberland about um, the implications of all of that. Okay, so let me begin. So when so Seymour, Seymour uh, arrived in Los Angeles with his message of baptism of the Spirit, let me start in esta tarde. When Seymour llega a la calle Azusa, Él comienza a predicar la palabra después de separarse de Miami, Texas. Él era un sanctified life. That's the way Parham sought to modify the holiness views of baptism in the spirit that he had inherited. For Parham, spirit baptism was a gift, not a grace. The power to witness was most prominently displayed in receiving the gift of speaking a foreign language, xenolalia, and the purpose of that gift was mission. Parham developed that view over against men like A.B. Simpson of the Christian Missionary and Alliance Church. A.B. Simpson had an understanding that baptism with the Spirit was equal to the Johannine idea of an abiding anointing and deeper union with Christ. In Nyack, through a series of lectures in the mid-1890s, Simpson had asserted that the baptism of the Spirit was the power to declare the truth through an anointing, a baptism of love that brings unity among believers and supernatural gifts. And Simpson asserted, quote, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is our union with the living personality of the Spirit. Simpson's attempt to combine the charismatic and sanctifying work of the Spirit into a doctrine of Spirit baptism was rejected by Parham. Instead, Parham went more like R.A. Torrey's charismatic interpretation. In Torrey's words, quote, we should not look and long for ecstatic experiences, but for the power and efficiency from God. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is not for the purpose of cleansing from sin, but for the purpose of empowering for service. The power to witness for Tory comes from the impartation of the gifts that the Spirit brings. Clearly, Tory interpreted the baptism with the Spirit exclusively or almost exclusively through a charismatic lens. Parham simply modified that position by reducing the list of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 to the gift of tongues and interpreting that gift as speaking in a foreign language on the basis of Acts 2. The miracle of Acts 2 for Parham was the capacity to speak a foreign language. 
Nevertheless, he maintained that baptism with the Spirit was a power to witness through charismatic endowment upon the sanctified soul. That much seems clear from the way in which Parham's own sister described her journey before, long before Seymour ever met Parham. Lillian Thistlewaite says this, I had not searched the scriptures to know the Bible evidence, nor heard the decision of those who had, but in my mind concluded, as the gifts are in the Holy Ghost, any of the nine gifts would prove the baptism. Clearly, Parham was operating in this framework in which the Lucan baptism with the Spirit was a charismatic gift poured out on the sanctified soul, and that gift was speaking in a foreign language. What Seymour preached in the little holiness church that Julia Hutchins pastored in Los Angeles after he arrived in February of 1906 was most likely a version of that message. As late as September of that same year, long after the Azusa revival had exploded, he was still, Seymour that is, was still claiming that the baptism with the Holy Spirit is a gift of power upon the sanctified life. He says, quote, too many have confused the grace of sanctification with the endowment of power or the baptism with the Holy Ghost. Others have taken the anointing that abideth for the baptism and failed to reach the glory and power of someone who claimed sanctification. That's simply parum regurgitated. But given the challenge of Parham's inadequate theology um, and the challenge that, that Seymour had to address over Parham's visit, um, he had to alter the way in which he understood spirit baptism. Um, there were two, these were the two significant challenges that forced Seymour to begin to, re to rethink this more charismatic understanding of baptism with the spirit. Let me just explain them a little more carefully. First, Parham's working theory that baptism was xenolalia, the gift of foreign languages, was proving to be unsustainable, mainly because there had been so few, unver so few verified actual foreign languages being spoken. What was happening at Azusa instead was described by Frank Bartleman as the color line being washed away or being caught up in an ocean of love not everyone suddenly speaking in foreign languages and then going out on the mission. This was because what had begun as a Bible study in the home of an African-American couple had morphed into a full interracial revival by mid-April 1906. During the same decade that Jim Crow laws would reach their zenith, um, Seymour was shepherding a fully inclusive and fully integrated mission at the former AME Church, now the Azusa Street Mission. By fully inclusive, I want to be clear that what I mean is there were no segregated spaces at Azusa. Individuals from various nationalities and ethnicities mixed together in the upper room where they tarried for the baptism and in the main room where services were held. And this was happening in the very city that J.P. Whitney, who had helped Phineas Brzee found the Church of the Nazarene, was calling the new Rome of Anglo-Saxon civilization. Seymour was invested in racial inclusion, but it wasn't just that. He also wanted full integration from this racial inclusion. What I mean by full integration is he wanted a full sharing of power and authority between races, classes, and genders because he thought that was fully reflective of the kingdom of God. So the board of the mission and the leadership at Azusa reflected the ethnic and national mix of the services and included both men and women. Parham's theology of Xenolalia was proving too narrow to contain the work of the spirit at Azusa. The second challenge, however, was even more severe and that challenge came in Parham's explicit racism in the face of the interracial dynamic at Azusa. When Parham arrived in late October, he walked to the two boxes that stood in a place of in, in the place of a pulpit, and he declared that God was sick to his stomach and that God hated, quote, any such animalism as was in progress, close quote. When Parham looked upon what was happening in the upper room, 
and the mixing where people tarried and laid hands on one another and black and brown bodies and white bodies were all together. He described it as religious orgies. He would later say, I found hypnotic influences, familiar spirit influences, spiritualistic influences, mesmeric influences and all kinds of spells, spasms, falling in trances, etc. All of these things are foreign to and unknown in this movement outside of Los Angeles. Parham set up a rival mission at the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which ultimately failed. But he was trying to overthrow Seymour's leadership. And when that did not succeed, he ended up over the next several years unleashing a, ra a torrent of racist rhetoric in his own publication. It was pretty clear that Parham didn't like the race mixing at Azusa. When one African-American woman appealed to him that blacks and whites loved each other at Azusa, he recoiled and later wrote that an outsider would have viewed this as just an another bunch of inward lovers and free lovers. That's how severe his rhetoric became. Parham reminded Seymour that the color line could not be washed away so easily, even by someone like Parham, who supposedly claimed to be sanctified and baptized with the Spirit. So given the challenge of Parham's inadequate theology in the face of what was happening at Azusa and his racism, coupled with the powerful experiences <clears throat> of being baptized with love, Seymour, I would suggest, began to rethink his theology of spirit baptism from the many testimonies that he heard, like G.B. Cashwell's denouncing of race prejudice and having black hands laid on his head and beginning to speak with tongues once he moved beyond that prejudice, Seymour knew that Pentecostal power was bringing about racial reconciliation and that a Pentecostal theology of baptism with the Spirit had to address that crucial point. So what I want to argue for a few minutes is that Seymour began to do that over the next several years, as early as 1906, December of 1906, and that his mature theology of Spirit baptism, he developed between 1908 and 1914, and we need to recover that theology. Seymour developed this theology by returning to his own deeply held Wesleyan theology. He had developed that theology long before he encountered Charles Parham. Between 1900 and 1906, Seymour had spent time in Indianapolis learning from the Evening Light Saints who had been led by Daniel Warner, now the Church of God Anderson, a holiness movement. And then he went to Cincinnati where he learned under the tutelage of Martin Wells Knapp and God's Bible, God's Revival School. Um, he learned from both of these experiences that baptism with the Spirit was a sanctifying encounter that facilitated racial reconciliation, because when you got love in your soul, you had to love everybody. Seymour fused that idea with, the note, with Parham's notion that it was a charismatic encounter. So here's what Seymour begins to do. He returns to this Wesleyan framework that spells out baptism with the Spirit, in terms of its sanctifying and charismatic effects and places it in the context of a third operation or work of the Spirit as opposed to just a gift on the sanctified life. He says this, that many individuals think that they have sanctification and when they have it, they have all that they need. They say, away with this third work. What Seymour implies by that language of third work is that the baptism of the Spirit is an operation of the Spirit, distinct from regenerating grace and sanctifying grace, and yet building on each of those. Spirit fullness for Seymour was not a quantitative state, as though you could be half empty and then you were going, moving up and like filling a cup. Spirit fullness was receiving all the various operations of the Spirit, within the soul and what they did to you as a result. He placed it in that Wesleyan framework, which defines spirit baptism in terms of a third operation of grace. How did he do this? Well, 
it seems to me that he placed it in the context of a notion of the bride and actually moved into what I would call bridal mysticism. Seymour's view of baptism with the Spirit is best characterized as a unitive and ecstatic encounter with Christ, who is the bridegroom. That unitive encounter with Christ, your bridegroom, turns you into a living temple where you begin to radiate the glory of God and begin to love all persons as you radiate that glory. Using the images of bride and temple, then Seymour argued that the power of baptism with the Spirit was love commissioned and sent out. I would go so far as to say this, that Seymour and then early Pentecostals following him went down the Wesleyan way of salvation, which saw love and its fruition within the life of the Christian as the ultimate aim of these operations of the Spirit. Love was birthed in the soul through regeneration. Love was consecrated and matured in the soul in sanctification, and love was commissioned and sent out in spirit baptism. Ultimately, spirit baptism not only was a charismatic move into the gifts, it was a sanctifying move into the Holy of Holies, whereby the glory of God radiated and transformed black and brown and white faces so that they began to glow with his love and his power. Let me spell that out in several steps for Seymour. First, Seymour thought that the baptism of the Spirit seals you as a member of the bride. For Seymour, the baptism of the Spirit seals you as the crowning work of salvation in this life, but directly related to glorification and the eschaton. At times, he will, he will move into bridal mysticism. He, like when he says this, we are married to Christ now in the Spirit. Not only when he comes in glory are, will, are we married to Christ, but right now. If you are sanctified and baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, you are married to him already. Why does he say that? Because he had heard testimonies from men like Charles H. Mason who described their speaking in tongues as the wedlock with Christ. Christ has somehow kissed me as I spoke the language of another world. Union with Christ then came through this ecstatic encounter because you were a person reforged in the crucible of the Spirit. America wasn't the melting pot for Seymour. No, the altar was the crucible. The altar was the, Mary, was the melting pot. It was the place where the Spirit reforged you, and tongues was the sign of that being reforged. Moreover, spirit baptism for Seymour pointed toward the final reign of Christ. Thus, for him, speaking in tongues was a sign of our final rest. <clears throat> he says this, people do not have to travail and agonize for the baptism. For when our work ceases, then God comes. We cease from our own works, which is the very type of the millennium. Being caught up into the presence of Christ, your bridegroom, is a foretaste of the final glory that you will have as you embrace him and all the saints. Hence, you cannot be baptized with the Spirit and not embrace the saints or be embraced by the saints around you. Second, Spirit baptism was about entering the Holy of Holies and receiving the Shekinah glory of God. Sanctification for Seymour places you upon the altar where the fire continuously falls. When he said things like that, he was echoing Phoebe Palmer and other holiness thinkers who saw the act of consecration as a continuous placing of your life upon the altar so that the fire of Pentecost might fall upon it. He admonished people to continually put yourself on the altar, stating, and the great Shekinah glory is continually burning and filling with heavenly light. The tongues of fire in Acts 2 symbolized for Seymour the resting of the glory cloud upon the person who is spirit baptized. Almost in a sense, like Luke describes the glory coming upon Jesus at his transfiguration, or the glory coming upon Mary as the power from the Most High overshadowed her. The point is that the individual glows with the power and glory of God as he or she is immersed into the Spirit's presence in baptism. 
So there's something going on here for Seymour. Baptism in the Spirit is simultaneously a being caught up into the presence of Christ and a, a descent of the Spirit. So as the Spirit descends in glory upon you, you are caught up into the presence of Christ, the bridegroom, in which you embrace him in ecstatic union. And tongues is the initial sign of that encounter. <clears throat> it's out of all that, then, that, tongue, that Seymour modifies the language of power. By, he affirms that it's an endowment with power, but when he talks about power to witness or to testify, he says this, the baptism with the Holy Ghost gives us power to testify to a risen, resurrected Savior. Our affections are in Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The power to testify comes when your affections are righted in spirit baptism. The witness is the outworking of love in the heart. You have been embraced by your bridegroom in a loving kiss. You now have to embrace others with that same love. But in addition, for Seymour, power means authority, which is expressed in and through the gifts and the miraculous works. So just as there is a sanctifying dimension to spirit baptism, where you're immersed in love, there's a charismatic dimension so that authority is transmitted to you. Signs and wonders following Mark 16 will follow those who have been baptized in the Spirit. You have been given authority and made a prophet. In a sense, for Seymour, it's the prophethood of all believers. So when the person is saved, sanctified, and filled with the Spirit, he says the same life, the same authority that Jesus promised, we will find in this life. For Seymour, then power ultimately means that the Spirit is flowing through your humanity in terms of authority and charismatic gifting, which is why women and men must serve in leadership, which is why anyone who's baptized with the Spirit is qualified by that baptism to lead God's people. He says this, you have power with God as Elijah have. We become prophets and take up the prophetic mantle to speak the gospel of love and power to this world. Finally, for Seymour, tongues then, was the witness to the work. In good Wesleyan fashion, he operated out of a framework which said there's a work and there's a witness. In regeneration, the work is being born again, but the witness is the spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of the living God. Our cries of Abba, Father, are, are given forth through the spirit, reminding us that we have been brought and adopted into the family of God. Even so, for Seymour, tongues, like the cry of Abba, are the direct and immediate witness of the Spirit, with our spirit, that the baptism had occurred. Now, I want to be clear that because, even though tongues is the direct and immediate witness, spirit, Seymour did not think it was the only witness. Seymour differentiated between a direct and immediate witness and an indirect and ongoing witness. For Seymour, tongues was the external sign, but the internal work was always in an increase in love and power. It was charismatic gifting and sanctifying love. He puts it bluntly, tongues are not salvation. Love was the most enduring sign of baptism in the Spirit for Seymour. So if you are not loving, you are negating by that a failure to love your brother and sister, the very work of God, regardless of whether that initial sign came across your lips or not, you could undo the work by your subsequent behavior. All of this is to say that Seymour developed a theology of spirit baptism, whereby we are caught up in the presence of our bridegroom, embracing him in ecstatic union as the spirit descends in glory. And the glory begins to flow in us and through us to all those that are around us. The, the direct and immediate sign of that event is we begin to utter the language of the kingdom, a manifestation of tongues, not a gift of foreign language. As the outflow of that is that we ought to love our brother and sister. The outflow of that is that the color line should be washed away by the sanctifying and empowering work of the Spirit. The outflow of that is that we ought to be one community. Seymour developed that theology over against the challenge of Parham in the way in which Parham sought to devalue that unifying work 
of the baptism of the Spirit. And I would say to you that we have to recover the rich and robust way in which Seymour defines spirit baptism. Because if we don't, if we just say it's empowerment for witness, we flatten it out and make it something that it's not. We can't simply uplift the charismatic dimension over and exclude the sanctifying dimension. We have to think about it as both. We have to proclaim that he is turning us into temples, habitations of the glory and presence of the living God. And we now function as that temple, both as individuals and together in sealing us and making us members of the bride. He is making us brothers and sisters of one another. And it is our duty to walk that out in love. That is our birthright. That vision of racial reconciliation bound up in the theology of the baptism of the spirit that Seymour sought to articulate. Now, it's very clear to me that Pentecostals have not always been faithful to that vision. We have sometimes, we have many times, failed to live out that vision of what a spirit-baptized life really looks like. And our challenge today, in the face of the context that we live in, is to recover that vision that we might be, exhibit to the world the glory of the kingdom of the living God, the glory that divinely inbreaks from another world. And when people see us laying hands on one another and see the glory radiating off the black and brown and white faces and see us assembled around the altar and hugging and crying and praying and being one together and seeing us sharing power out of that, they will surely cry out, the living God is among us. That's our challenge today. And that's how I want to leave it. Well, that is quite a challenge. I think that, um, well, before I have any comment, I want to introduce uh, Bishop Anthony Pelt. Bishop Pelt is the administrative bishop for the Church of God in Florida at the Cocoa Office. He is also on the board of directors of Pentecostal Theological Seminary, and um, he is a student at Pentecostal Theological Seminary. Uh, I am glad to count Bishop Pelt as a dear friend and brother. And it's good to have him here with us tonight. Uh, Bishop Pelt, um, first, I would just like to ask you your initial uh, reflections and uh, response to Dr. Coulter. You know, the thing that struck me, and let me just say to everyone watching, it's an honor to be here with you, to be with Dr. Coulter, who is a phenomenal teacher. Let me just kind of cut across the field and say he is phenomenal to uh, Dr. Dan uh, Tomlin, who is also a uh, a phenomenal teacher, and if you get a chance to uh, to see some of his uh, writings, I think today he did one on the, the view of the earth. I always get a kick out of them as well, and to uh, Brother uh, Lima, who is translating, and I hope that my Geekism, uh, I don't even know if there's a translation for that, will not uh, interfere with his trying to translate. He will have to be truly Pentecostal to uh, help me today. But I think the thing that struck me, uh, as Dr. Coulter was sharing, was that this life, this theology, this spirit experience, this full-fledged Holy Ghost life that Dr. Seymour shared to see, unfortunately, that it never came to full fruition, that it started in fire and it's flickering instead of being a blazing flame. Um, to see how the Holy Ghost manifested itself um, in that movement, to see the manifestation mature a man, to see that, that manifestation move a people, but then to be diminished and pretty much dismissed in some regard because of society and cultural rules and norms. And to see that even now, those rules, those norms seem to be, uh, again, being a formidable force to resist the power of the Holy Ghost. And one of the things I think we have to come to grips with, especially as Pentecostals, I'm, I'm passionately Pentecostal, that as you heard Dr. Coulter speaking, 
that the manifestation and the ministry of the Holy Ghost is very, very comprehensive. It is, it is not meant to be put in a silo. It is not meant to be compartmentalized. It moves your mouth. The, the agent of communication, it, it, it is not uncommon that the Holy Ghost would, would use tongues because it was a tongue that deceived Eve. It would be a tongue that would divide people at Babel. Uh, it, it would be it would it, it would be tongues that would, would show people to come back to the Father. And yet, it was Palm's tongue who literally began to destroy what was happening. And I think we have to just come to grips with something that if the power of the Holy Ghost is the motivator and movement of our mouth, He is comprehensive also in our motives. That that. We claim a sanctified life. He creates in us a new heart. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things become new, which means our motives literally do become new. And so me as a black man, African-American, my motives have been totally transformed, just like my mouth. And I think that's why the Lord said I had to do it in your heart, because your heart is deceiving your mouth. If I don't get your heart right, guess what your mouth will never get right. But not only is he the God and the Holy Ghost of comprehensive of our mouth and our motives, but he knows that there will never be any meaningful ministry in this world except by the power of the Holy Ghost. And if we've seen uh, different things come through, I think the Lord is pushing the church to say, listen, the ministry of reconciliation is not just God, a man to God, a God to man, but brother to brother. And it's that the birthright we must now fight for. Because I do say this, and I've said it personally, you can get to heaven not knowing me, but you shouldn't get to heaven without knowing me. And that's what the Holy Ghost was trying to do, to say, I am my brother's keeper. And though we may be ethnically different, we are now powered by and external, see that the glory of God has now empowered us to enter into relationships one with another. And I just passionately believe as a Pentecostal, we should fight for that. We should fight for that. And I think the Lord has now just set a wonderful stage for the vision that I believe he was beginning to work in Seymour to be worked out in our day. Okay, I want to take just a moment to remind those of you who are watching that if you have a question or a comment, you can share it in the Q&A or the chat. Um, I do have one person who has asked Dr. Coulter if this uh, lecture will be available in print in any way. Um, do you have a response for that? I mean, it can be. I don't, the question would be where to, uh, but it's certainly, obviously, it's been written out, at least some of it. You know, I did a little Pentecostal thing and left my text there on a few occasions. But uh, it has, uh, I, I do have it. So we can talk about that. Okay, I'm, well, I'm we'll we will talk about that and see how we can make that available. Um, one of the things that um, I think surprises us sometimes Um is it seems like that uh, we go through these periods of relative peace. And, and I want to point out, uh, Bishop Pelt is here, but we, when we're talking about this Azusa, the spirit of Azusa, one of the things that was remarkable about Los Angeles at the time and the Azusa movement was uh, the influx of immigrants from all over the world. So there were Asians, there were African-Americans, there were Hispanics there. So uh, we want to... Um, uh, lift that up, that we're not just talking about issues here between uh, the, the conflict between historically uh, white and black. We want to acknowledge that we're talking about the conflict uh, of all ethnicities, even though there's no way in this conversation we can have everyone represented. Um, we, we just want to lift that up. But I'm wondering, um, Bishop Pelt, uh, we look at um, this, this vision of Azusa Street that um, Dr. Coulter has presented to us, this theology of spirit baptism. And I'm gonna ask you a personal question here and, and just, um, but when you look at the failure of Pentecostalism through the century, we're just over a century year old as a movement. 
Um, when you look at the failure, um, you know, there have been those times, those seasons when voices uh, spoke out, but overall there's been very little movement and uh, in, in, in embracing brothers and sisters of color uh, and, and trying to find ways to include them fully in the life of the church. Um, is to speak to us personally, if you don't mind, about uh, your reflections on how it seems like that we have failed to follow the Spirit in this regard. You know, one of the great tensions that I have, uh, my, my first undergrad is in political science. And as a uh, student of political science, um, and just in our personal life, the civil rights movement was, was prominent. Um, to talking about how King and, and the different ones had the tension of trying to secure voting rights and different things. And, and the thing on, on a very personal level that I thought about even just recently, that my dad, my mom, and my father uh, were probably the last generation. I'm, I'm probably part of that first generation that was a little more in the integration and uh, to know that all my life, I predominantly was, I was church of God all my life, but every city, and I have no problem even addressing this, even in the state of Florida, uh, we had a church of God on one side of the track, and there was another church of God on the other side of the tracks. And the tracks, we were good during the day, and we may have some form of fellowship, but the fullness of the Holy Ghost never to, to this day that I know, allowed someone who was white to come from that church to our church to become a member. It was always a privilege and an honor to leave our church and go to their church. And one of the things that would be said is, uh, you guys have spirit, but you don't have scholarship. You guys have gifts, but you don't know how to present the gospel. And now that I'm an administrative bishop, I have to push back and remind those that one of the things that the Holy Ghost has done is he's broken down those walls. And I tell people, I don't have a problem with you going to a church here or you going to a church there. But it was almost in bread with even in our movement to see certain groups as inferior. And if they were going to be a little more superior, they had to leave where they were and come to another culture. And I think one of the things Seymour was trying to say, listen, you said the doctor. I don't think it's ironic that the Lord left this fall in Los Angeles. It was home of uh, Indians and Mexicans and Asian Pacific people. It was the Lord trying to remind us everybody is valuable. And more than that, they can all be victorious under the power of the Holy Ghost. And so in the fifth grade, I moved to a predominantly white neighborhood. I think we were the first family that I can remember that moved to this neighborhood. And for six months, I was called the N-word by every kid on the street. I mean, just they just gave it to me full barrel. And Dr. Coach said, because my mom and dad are straight Pentecostal, speaking in tongues, falling out of the floor all the time. My mom, they would, they would get on me about fighting. I, I wanted to fight them to let them know you ain't going to call me that. And we just lived. Matter of fact, I just left the house. I'm a state officer. I left, just left the house. I, my mom and dad still live in that neighborhood. One of the kids who called me the N word was in my wedding. And we laugh about it now to some degree because my mom and dad were so passionately Pentecostal. They refused to let the anger that I was feeling and the aggravation I was receiving to diminish the anointing. My mother made them come eat with us. My mother took them to church. And as a result of that, they learned me. I learned them. I live with them. They live with me. And it's unfortunate that sometime in our movement that we have not had the, what I call the live-in moments. We live around folks, but we don't live with them. One of the things that Seymour's theology was helping people, you can live with these people. Because the diversity is not the problem. Diversity is really not the problem. It's, it is the devil who makes you see someone else as an enemy. It makes you see. Again, Dr. Cody, I just think that the Lord is, is 
strategically as he always does, putting the church in a place where we're going to have to deal with this issue. Uh, I see my, my uh, internet maybe acting up a little bit. We're going to have to deal with the issue of reconciliation on so many levels. And it's going to take the Holy Ghost. When this all is said and done, we're going to say, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by his spirit. That's probably the best way to kind of give a little antidote for my own personal life. That's great. I will, um, I will come back to you because I have a question for you that I would like for us to talk about, but I do have uh, some questions for Dr. Coulter. First, um, what is the book, uh, Dr. Coulter, that you spoke from concerning Seymour's theology? Did you uh, reference a book? Someone is asking a question about a book that you may have referenced. Um, I don't remember referencing a specific book for Seymour, Although I will say that um, Gaston Espinosa has put together a book called William Seymour and the Origins of Global Pentecostalism. And in that book, he has assembled all of Seymour's writings. Um, one of the challenges is that you have the apostolic faith periodical, and it was most likely edited by two women, Florence Crawford, Clara Lum. There are a lot of unsigned articles. So, um, the only thing we can be certain that's from Seymour is when we see an article with his name attached to it. And then we know that he also modified the AME Doctrines and Disciplines book um, and made it the basis for the Azusa Street mission. And so that's all in there. So if you want a single place to get access to everything that he's written that we can be confident is from him, I would say go to Gaston Espinosa's work. And that's where you can get it. Um, and that's a better way of doing it than to try to, some people just read the, Azu, the apostolic faith papers. And you really have to differentiate between Seymour's writings and everything else going on in those papers. Because as I said, Claire Lum and Florence Crawford were in control of that. So some of the articles I think reflect their theology, not necessarily Seymour's theology. And I think you gotta, you gotta be careful to differentiate between those two so that would be would it be fair and this is just my question would it be fair to say however that um the articles represent the theology of the apostolic faith movement yes but here's what you discover they're not on the same page when it comes to spirit baptism because that is that is a a doctrine in development um so there are some that will, you'll find some articles that will say it is a gift, not a work. And I'm convinced that that's not where Seymour ends up because I think he's, he comes back to the Wesleyan position. So some people continue to try to hang on to Parham's theology, um, which I do think is more reflective of Tory's um, charismatic emphasis and you know, you could also mention Frank Sanford. Um, both Tory and Frank Sanford were Congregationalists, New England Congregationalists. And so that theology is coming out of that vestige of Puritanism, I would say. Um, and Lord, sort of thinking of the language of power exclusively in terms of charismatic gifting. And you do see that reflected in certain articles, but I, I'm convinced that Seymour is shifting away from that. Um, so I do think you have to be careful and think about there are theologies at play as they're trying to work all this out. Um, so that would be that would be my way of answering yes is the short answer to your question. But you know the longer answer is you've got to differentiate and say it's not a unified voice. It's, it's a number of voices. Okay. Um Zachary Barnes is asking, or first comment and then a question. It looks as though Seymour shifts from a transactional model of spirit baptism, parentheses, gift for something, that is service, uh, for transformation model, which is union with God. Uh, the question is, is the transactional model of spirit baptism, which Parham seems to hold, as did Tory, reflective of Reformed theology, so that what we are seeing is the tension between Reformed Pentecostal and Wesleyan Pentecostal visions of spirit baptism. 
<clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. I wouldn't go so far as to say that. The reason why is because A.B. Simpson is not there. Um, so s s if you read Simpson's lectures on the spirit, which he's giving in Nyack in the mid 1890s, he really does have this more unitive understanding of spirit baptism, um, which is why Simpson, I think, after Pentecostalism breaks out, wrestles with it. It's why it, when it when it hits CMA churches, Christian Missionary Alliance churches, it tears them apart because they have Simpson's theology, and it's looking like his theology ought to lead them to embrace the Pentecostal message. And Simpson himself sought it, um, and that's why he formulates this "ask not, forbid not" uh, kind of thing um, as a compromise position. So. Uh, I wouldn't quite say it's totally reformed, although I would say it it finds a more hospitable terrain within a reformed dynamic is is the way I would put it. And if you think about, um, I'll give you the, the three examples here of this, especially congregationalism, interestingly enough. So Frank Sanford, R.A. Torrey, but E.W. Kenyon is also congregationalist, from Baptist congregationalist. And so that more transactional theology, which gives rise to Kenyon's name it, claim it theology, right? Um, and which influences Hagen and word of faith folks. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that certainly has a more hospitable terrain within that, that dimension. And I think Seymour is trying to develop something that's more robust. It's not just Seymour. If you want to look at Mason's theology, if you look at G.B. Cashwell, there's a reason why Cashwell names his periodical the Bridegroom's Messenger. If you look at G.F. George Floyd Taylor, there's a reason why his work is the Spirit and the Bride. His um, uh, first defense of the Pentecostal message. So you can see in these deep Wesleyan places their attempt to really bring it into this unitive dimension where it's these various operations of the spirit is about love growing. And that's what grounds this notion of ra racial reconciliation. Uh, that if, if we're really caught up in the spirit's presence, we have to be reconciled. And, and I'll just say one other point here on this. Seymour operationalized that by picking leaders who reflected the inclusive nature of the revival. What Pentecostals have failed to do is operationalize the vision of Azusa, and some have actively resisted it. So you get biracial models of segregation, um, and unfortunately the Church of God went in that direction, which was more Methodistic, where you have a black work a black conference that is segregated from the other works, right? And you don't have a sharing of power and authority, um, a full integration model. So um, we, we really have to work on operationalizing this vision of spirit baptism. I think we got to recover it and we got to operationalize it. Uh, I want to uh, make a distinction here uh, before I ask this question of Bishop Pelt. Um, um, I know that there's a lot going on when we're talking about uh, the politics, national politics, and, and the cultural politics. But what I want to specifically address right here at the moment is what this would look like in the church as the body of Christ, uh, thinking that the church might be a witness uh, to the nation. Um, Bishop Pelt, how do you think, to use Dr. Coulter's term, how do you think that we can move forward in ways to operationalize the, the moving of the spirit so that uh, we embrace one another, but not just embrace one another, but make sure that the leadership of our churches reflects uh, the body of Christ? What, what would you see as some ideas in going forward that, that we might need to consider and embrace? You know, as, as I was sitting here today, I'm, I, I'm, like I said, I'm in the state office in Florida, Cocoa, and in September, October, Evangel, uh, it was an issue pretty much dedicated to ethnic diversity in the church. 
and I, I've been a firm believer of this, and, and I, uh, I think one of the things we just have to do is we almost just have to do it. Uh, in this country, Brown versus Board of Education mandated that separate could not be equal. It made everybody mad, but then you had to do it. Affirmative action says you had to hire people of different ethnic groups. It made everybody mad, but you had to do it. The NFL even came up with the Rooney Rule that says you must interview a minority candidate. Made everybody mad, but they had to do it. I think sometimes churches just have to say there are certain things we are just going to do. When me and my brother used to fight, my mother would give us the spanking and then they hug one another. I hated it. I hated the spanking. I hated the hugging. But I had to do it. And guess what? I still love my brother. I think we're at a place where we need to get the spanking, do the hugging, and love the brother. So it's me. I hate the, the nomenclature of quotas. But I tell people, if if you must put someone somewhere, I, I start right here for the folks. I'm right here. I'll come Hispanic, Asian, and we should say you must have in your office. Uh, when it comes to our churches. Now, churches may be a little different, but I think one of the things we must now also do in our church, we must culturalize in our churches the ability to see ethnic people everywhere. Not just in church, but anywhere and everywhere in the church. So you shouldn't be comfortable just seeing a person of a different race or gender as a greeter. You should be able to see them comfortably as heavenly gospel. Uh, you should be able to see them comfortably engaged in the ministry of preaching and teaching on a regular basis. And, and I tell people, as pastor, that comes to us. We should be able to do that. And then I think as we look to transition, we just need to be honest and open and say, listen, we, if we do that well enough, it should be easy to transition anybody into a position of preaching, proclamation, singing. Why? Because we're not doing it just to do it, but we're doing it because we know that spirit field. Our church is a spirit field church, and people that grow up in this church, the Holy Ghost lifts up, builds up, and we believe if the Holy Ghost fills them up and builds them up, guess what? They can help continue to help lift us up for the glory of God. But I understand that that requires that we be honest and say that we have impediments within our structure that makes it easy to just say, oh, well, we tried. We just couldn't get it done. And I just think that we are, we're struggling with what are those mandates? I'm prepared. As John said something, I think about the scripture. John the Baptist really can be really mad with Jesus. I, your first cousin, I, yeah, I'm, I'm the first convert, I'm the first person to get spirit filled, and I'm in jail, and you don't come see me. He asked the question very simple, and I, I'm telling you, I think this is what this generation is asking. Is the Pentecostal church the one, or should we look for another? Jesus hears that and says, go back and tell John these things. And John says these words, I must decrease that he must increase. And I believe as it comes to racial recon reconciliation, and where we're going to, somebody got to be willing to decrease that someone else can increase. And John was not saying that Jesus was inferior. He knew Jesus was, was the Messiah. I just think that if we're serious about being Pentecostal and spirit-filled people, I have to decrease that he might increase, which means I want to subject myself to someone of a different culture, of a different color, of a different gender, within the biblical confines, and I'm going to be okay with that. And, and I, again, I think that the Holy Ghost is doing something very, very strategic. I know a lot of people want to talk politics, but we now have an African-American woman as the vice president. And it's almost like God saying, now, if they can, if they can get this right, and, and it's dead wrong on many cases, how is it that the body of Christ who should be getting it right still getting it wrong? I have two questions, and I'm going to let everybody know we're going to go past our time just a little bit. Uh, Tony Ritchie asked, it seems Pastor Seymour was able to maintain continuing emphasis on both personal and social aspects of holiness. 
given a frequent tendency today to emphasize one at the expense of the other, how might we recover Seymour's vision more successfully, Dr. Coulter? Well, my colleague asks a great question, of course. <laughs> um, you know, whenever I think of this social vision, it has uh, two components for Seymour. It, first of all, it begins in the people of God around the altar under the crucible of the spirit okay so when wesley for example says there's no holiness it's not social holiness he first and foremost means you can't be holy apart from the people of god uh you know cashwell's prejudice is only challenged when he walks into the building and needs to have black hands laid on him and that it's in the middle of the people of god that suddenly he's confronted with his own prejudice right so the, the social context begins there, right? Um, from there, then, you could think about the way in which um, holiness and Pentecostal folks saw social holiness in two ways, I'd say. <clears throat> the first is they saw it unfolding in what I'd call missionary activism. By missionary activism, I mean feeding the poor, um, ministering to those who are less fortunate, you know, through orphanages, soup kitchens, whatever. This is where the work of Salva the Salvation Army, the work of, which is a holiness body. Um, one of the first things, you know, we did in the Church of God was orphanages because of A.J. Tomlinson. You know, all these things. That's what I call missionary activism. You look at early Pentecostals, many of them are engaged in missionary activism. And we have people doing that still. And I think, you know, I want to affirm what, you know, the churches and the people and our Myths that are doing that and encourage us to continue to do that. Um, and you're doing it across, you know, class lines, ethnic lines, those sorts of things, right? And I'd say how you do it depends on the need in the community, right? Um, but the second way in which you see this happening, and this is where Pentecostals are not, um, have been hesitant but have become more less hesitant in other parts of the world than in the U.S., and that is in political activism. Um, now, here's the thing that I, I think people don't always understand. The church becomes politically active when it seeks to defend itself over against external threats, okay? So this political action that we've seen over the last several years under Trump, right, and people have become pretty politically active, I mean, what they don't understand sometimes is this is exactly why Pentecostals, African-American Pentecostals, had to become politically active under Jim Crow, because that their church, which is really our church, was under threat. But we don't see that, we don't recognize the continuity between those two things, right? Um, but there is continuity. So I'd say the church becomes politically active, and you see this all the way through. The apologists in the second century start writing defenses of Christianity, not because they're trying to give an intellectual, co intellectually coherent understanding of the faith, but because they're a minority community who are being martyred at the hands of Roman officials, and they got to defend their people because their lives are at stake. So apologetics was in defense of the church when it was under threat. Political activism, we, we move into that when the people of God are under threat. And what we have to recognize is it's not just white people of God. We don't just do it when white people of God are under threat. We do it when any um, any ethnic groups under threat. When African Americans are under threat, we should have been marching with them, right? And in fact, you see holiness people, you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, one of the largest women's holiness bodies in the United States. I mean, this is exactly what they're doing when they when they become politically active and talk about women's right to vote because they knew that women could not bring holiness to their families when they were legally bound to their husbands in such a way that if their husband was an alcoholic, he could still control the wife, still do whatever he wanted to the, to the wife, and she had no recourse. So they, knew they needed political power for the wife so she could exercise spiritual power in the home over her husband when he himself is not fulfilling his duty as a husband. So, I, I mean, that's 
that's the way I would say they're trying to move out from missionary activism, which is the primary form of social activism, bringing social holiness throughout the land, to political activism when the church is under threat to preserve the integrity of the church and its message. I, now, come, let me say, say something. You know, I want to add one more thing. That one of the things that I'm trying to just as me being a student, that we maybe adopted uh, a culture of selective scholastic integrity. Tonight we're talking about William Seymour in a scholastic manner that I can promise you many people have never heard before. And one of the great challenges that I know I've experienced, and, and, it's, and I'm going to speak for, for African Americans from this one little area, because the church in the Pentecostal church was deliberate, unfortunately, it appears, in being scholastically lacking on the nature of the church, we let the palm movement, even the nature of what the Holy Ghost should do to us, it is, we are now suffering from that. And so people are asking the question, why should I trust you now? Mm. When, you, when you had all of this time to teach me, when you had all this time to tell me, why, why should I, and, and it's unfortunate that we now live in a day and time where a tweet and a post is becoming not a scholastic standard for people. It, it's hard to deal with a post and a tweet as we've seen. That if somebody gets a post and a tweet in their head, and that's the truth, it's hard to get the truth back into them. And that's why the whole issue of reconciliation must come to the, to the forefront. Whether it's at the border of, 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 of Mexico and Texas right now, whether it is uh, uh, dealing with uh, people coming from uh, human trafficking, these issues are critical to the Pentecostal Church because Dr. the culture just said, these are the means that the Holy Ghost has given us for missionary activism, and they then help us to literally proclaim our true political nature, that we are lovers of everyone. And it is not the will of God for any man to perish. He is not to perish under sin, and he is not to perish under a system that would make them see themselves as less than themselves. That was the beauty of the Azusa revival. That God was bringing all people together and say, you are all my creatures. And we will spirit feel. And claim the Holy Ghost show us everything. If he don't show us that, people will ask the question, what will the Holy Ghost show you? That's a, that's a critical, critical point right now. And, and here's the thing, you know, when, let me just quickly add something. You know, when you, uh, when you move in that direction that Bishop Hell is pushing us toward, I mean, the beautiful thing about Pentecostalism is you, God will do such wonderfully crazy things for you that will wake you up to the beauty of his people um, that, you know, you just, you just sort of in shock. And I'll give you an example. Um, I remember, uh, I was at a time where I was um, struggling. I'd applied to Oxford. I wasn't sure about everything. And um, we had a Spanish uh, language church meeting Sunday afternoons in Orlando. And I was on staff at this church. It was Span and there was a Puerto Rican church, basically Puerto Ricans. Um, and I was preaching with an interpreter. And after the service, just a, a blue collar guy couldn't speak English. He hadn't been in the U.S. that long. Um, and uh, he had come from the island uh, to the mainland and hadn't been in Florida. And uh, God spoke to him. He prophesies over me in Spanish and it gets interpreted into English that that God was going to take care of me and that I would would be in Oxford. And I'm telling you, in that moment, I just sat back and had to sort of laugh because here I was. I had finished my Master's of Divinity School, and this recent person who moved from Puerto Rico had not yet learned English, but he could prophesy over me in Spanish, and it be interpreted into English, 
And it was the word of God for me that I needed to hear right then and there. That is the beauty of what we see happening in Pentecostalism. If, but we got we to gotta be willing to let the Spirit speak um, and let God use people. All right, I'll, I'll stop there. That's great. No, no, no. I, I want to uh, close this out. My favorite motif for understanding Spirit baptism uh, actually comes from Paul in Romans 5, verse 5 where Paul says that God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So I like to think of a spirit baptism as a baptism of divine love. And when I hear this conversation, what occurs to me is basically we're talking about power. Um, when we talk about uh, the Holy Spirit baptism, we're talking about a baptism of God's power, uh, the, the transforming grace, the transforming power of God to transform our affections to move us to witness and my political remark uh, here would be that uh, as I have said many times that Democrats and Republicans don't need Christian support they need Christian witness um, both parties all parties need the, the people within those parties who hold Christ as Lord to be faithful witnesses uh, to uphold the gospel but the other thing about power when we're talking about in the church is we're still talking about a power of, uh, of, of who gets to spend money, a power of who makes decisions. And, and that sometimes is the greatest power for us to relinquish. Um, and so when we're talking about, that's why when we talk about, um, uh, we, we have to talk about power sharing sometimes. Um, there's this wonderful episode, and this is what I want to close with. There's this wonderful episode in the movie, Remember the Titans. If you've seen the movie, I love the movie. And I told my boys when we were watching it, I was kind of laughing all through the movie. I kept saying, hey, I lived through this. And this was what it was like. Um, but there's this episode when uh, Gary Bertier uh, has invited Julian to his home. And he tells his mama, it's on a Sunday morning. He's invited Julian to come have Sunday lunch with him. And he tells his mama, Julian's coming over. And she doesn't want him over. She doesn't want this young black football player in her house. And in, in exasperation, Gary says, Mama, just get to know him. And she replies, Gary, I don't want to get to know him. Now let's get dressed and go to church. In that one sentence, it, it encapsulates the problem that we have. Um, as we're getting dressed to go to church, we really don't want to know each other. And I think that's what the Holy Spirit calls us to do is we, we are reconciled to God. We, we've got to come to know God, but there needs to be this effective desire deep within us that we want to know each other. And uh, that's, I think that one of the questions we didn't have time to get to, and I'll just answer it here is why do we keep coming back to reconciliation when we've done this before? And my answer would be because we've not finished the job. Um, so you know, can I, can I, I know we have to go because you know, we, we build a cost, so you know, we get three closes before we have to really close. Go for it. And you, as, as you were talking, you know, I was thinking of scripture, you know, Peter is, is a real paradox to me. He, he's a real, he's, he's a real conundrum to me sometimes. And again, I just, it's been across my mind with two. He didn't want to go to Cornelius house. He, he, you know, the Lord had to take him to an open dream. Now, this is this, the this, what cut off a guy's ear, he done walked on the water, he, he, he gives the great sermon on the day of Pentecost, and he still got prejudice, he had to do it, right, now wait a minute. Yet, and I guess this is what I want to say to those of, of us who, who struggle with this, the Lord allows Paul to come alongside him. In the book of Galatians, we know that Paul confronts Peter. And I'm saying to anybody, this preacher right here says, do not be afraid to be spirit-filled, confrontational with another brother. You're going to speak the truth in love. And one, I will say, there's no easy way to tell somebody they ugly. There's just no easy way to do it. But sometimes you just got to do it. And with the Holy Ghost being the guider of, I start your mouth and your heart, you can look a brother in the face and say, my brother, my sister, I've had to do it. To black brothers and say, listen, Every white person is not the devil. Every black brother ain't your brother. Every, 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 every other ethnic group is, is not your enemy if they're a believer. They're, they're part of the body. 
And instead of you looking to let the rules of the world rule your heart, let the Holy Ghost rule your heart. Have a conversation. I, I make this plan to you. My phone number is 954. My wife gets mad at me because I give it to everybody. 775 4667. If I don't answer the call, just leave a message, but I'll call you back. Because I make this statement here in Florida, Coco. I'm praying for you. I need you to pray for me. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. You are important to me, and I need you to survive. I don't just need you for my personal salvation, but I need you because as we start tonight, the message of the Holy Ghost is being undermined. It is being belittled. It is being ridiculed. Because we, the people of power, are not living out that power. And God is making it very, very, very clear that there will be a witness in the world. I don't want to be Peter. Because at a certain point in the book of Acts, we don't even hear from Peter anymore. I want to be with Paul. And if I need the help of Peter get together, I hope that we'll do so. I love you guys. Dr. Tomlin, thank you again. And I hope I wasn't too Pentecostal at that point. That's great. Dr. Coulter, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm sure that we, this will provoke many more conversations, and I look forward to that. Bishop Pelt, thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your heart. Uh,